So, moving on in, into the flood itself, uh, it's pretty clear that this is sort of described in global catastrophic measures. Uh, so, now, a lot of people think, well, it must be a global flood because it describes it as a global flood. But is that really what's going on in the ancient Near Eastern world, where they describe these things as sort of global? What, what is your take on this as being sort of written in sort of like a global catastrophic event and what in regards to your research on this mm -hmm. uh, it's i think it's important to read it the way we read other old testament passages that is that's part of genre and we have this kind of universalistic language that occurs frequently in the old testament for example in zephaniah 1 verse 2 I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away men and beasts and birds in the sky, fish in the sea, and the idols that cause them to stumble. When I destroy all mankind from the face of the earth. But then it goes on in Zephaniah, and it's clear that he's talking about the destruction of Babylon, the destruction by Babylon on Judah. So it's clearly described in universalistic terms, but also clearly isn't universal. We get the same kind of thing in Lamentations 2, in verse uh, 22. Uh, it talks about, um, let me see, 2.22. It says, As you summoned to a feast day, you summoned against me terrors on every side. In the day of the Lord's anger, no one escaped or survived. Do you hear it? No one escaped or survived. But this is the, this is the fall of Judah. And we know that people went into exile. People did escape and survive. So we find that the biblical text uses universal language to describe huge cataclysms, disasters. So they use that language, but that doesn't mean they actually believed that it was universal in scope. We read texts like Genesis 41, 57, where it says, All the world came to Joseph for food. Mm. That sounds pretty universal. Are you going to read that literally? Well, if so, you've got to figure out how the Eskimos made it across the Atlantic <laughs> and not starve to death on the process. And all of them, not just representatives, because all the world came to Joseph for food. So we, we just have to be sensible about understanding how text works and how this language works. So we use the Bible's own rhetoric to demonstrate that universalistic language does not always pertain to a universal scope. Yeah, I, I, I always found that interesting that there's a lot of people I, I've talked to online that come on my channel, atheist, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, whoever, who tend to want to pick and choose sometimes. Like, clearly Joseph was being metaphorical, but when it comes to the flood, it has to be literal. And it's like, well, let's try to understand it in the context it was written in. There, they seem to be using these sort of hyperbole, this sort of just, you know, universal language. You also see that in a lot of the eschatology of the Bible, specifically passages like you mentioned with the destruction of Jerusalem and whatnot. And you see that in the New Testament as well. I mean, Matthew says that all the sick were coming out to Jesus. Well, we don't believe all everyone was coming out to Jesus. It was just a large number of people. So that's clearly a reoccurring theme in there. And I thought it was really good that you covered that in the book. But going on that point, a lot of skeptics, people that aren't Christians, will, or even young earth creationists, will say that this threatens the validity of scripture if it's using hyperbole. It has to be literal. Because if we start saying this is hyperbole, well then why is the resurrection not hyperbole? Why is other things not hyperbole? Is, doesn't this lead to some sort of like just picking and choosing uh, with regards to scripture, what is hyperbole and what isn't? Uh, and that's a valid point to raise, but of course we have we have methods in place to try to prevent that kind of misjudgment. As you can tell, I just demonstrated the universal use of, I mean, sorry, the use of universal language when describing major catastrophes. That's also true in the ancient Near East. They use universal language for major catastrophes, whether it's warfare or natural catastrophe. So we've demonstrated that legitimate use of rhetoric by showing other examples, which are clearly legitimate use of rhetoric. So that's not the same as saying anything you want can be metaphorical. Uh, this is a, a established form of rhetorical language in the Old Testament, and it even carries, as you said, into the New Testament. So 
there, there are methodological controls on that. You can't, we're trying to read it the way the author intended it, not just kind of make something metaphorical because we want it to be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really kind of funny to me. A couple months ago, I was on an atheist podcast called Dogma Debates, and the host, David Smalley, said this exact same thing. And I basically just told him what you told me. It's we got to read it in its actual context. This idea of a slippery slope that just because some parts are hyperbole, some parts are not, does not mean the whole thing is. I like to use the example of John 15.1. Do we believe Jesus really is a vine? Because he said, I am the true vine. No. We understand. Like, if we were going to read the Hamlet, we understand there's metaphors, but we also understand the basic general story. We let the text speak for itself. And that's why I always tend to recommend your books, because I think you do a good job of pointing that out. So, 